The War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells. Book Two: The Earth Under the Martians. Chapter Ten: The Epilogue. I cannot but regret, now that I am concluding my story, how little I am able to contribute to discussion of the many debatable questions which are still unsettled. In the one respect, I shall certainly provoke criticism. My particular province is speculative philosophy. My knowledge of comparative philosophy is confined to a book or two. It seems to me that Carver's suggestions as to the reason of the rapid death of the Martians, so probable as to be regarded almost as a proven conclusion, I have assumed that in the body of my narrative. And any, at any rate, in all the bodies of the Martians that were examined of the war, no bacteria except those already known as terrestrial species were found. They did not bury any of their dead. A reckless slaughter they perpetrated. Point also an entire ignorance of the perfectory process. But probable as this seems, it by no means a proven conclusion. Near his composed position, the black smoke known, which the Martians used with such deadly effect to generate the heat rays, remains a puzzle. The terrible disasters of Ealing and South Kingston laboratories would have declined analysis for further investigations upon the latter. Spectrum analysis of the dark black powder points unmistakably the brilliant presence of unknown element with brilliant group of three lines in the green. Possibly it combines with argon form a compound which acts at once with deadly effect upon some constitute in the blood. But if such unproven speculations will scarcely be of interest to the general reader to whom his story is addressed. None as brown scum that drifted down the Thames after destruction Shepperton examined at the time, and none is full for coming. Results in an anatomical examination of Martians, so far as the prowling dogs have left such an examination possible, I have already given, but any one is familiar with a magnificent, almost complete specimen of spirits in the National History Museum. The countless drawings that have been made from it, beyond that the interest of their philology structure, is purely scientific. The question of a graver and universal interest is possibility of another attack from the Martians. I do not think that nearly enough attention is being given to this aspect of the matter. A present the planet Mars in a conjunction by which every return is opposition, I will one appreciate a renewal of their venture. In any case, we should be prepared. It seems to me it should be possible to define the position of the gun for which the shots are discharged, to keep a stain watch upon this part of the planet to peace, to precipitate the arrival of the next attack. The case of Cylinder that might be destroyed with the limonite or trolley before it would significantly call for the Martian to merge, or they might be butchered by means of guns so soon as the screw opened. Seems to me that they may have lost the last advantage, failure of their first surprise. Possibly they see it in the same light. Lessing has advanced, advanced excellent reasons for supposing Martians have actually succeeded in effecting a landing on the planet Venus. Several months ago, now Venus and Mars were aligned with the Sun, and that is to say Mars was in opposition point of view of the observer on Venus. Subsequently, particular luminous and cinemas marking appeared and eliminated half of the inner planet. Almost simultaneously, a faint dark mark of cinemas. Cinemas character was dejected upon a photograph of the Martian disk. One needs to see a drawing these appearances in order to appreciate fully the remarkable resemblance in character. At any rate, neither do we expect another invasion or not. At any rate, whether we expect another invasion or not, our views of the human future must be greatly modified by these events. We have given, have learned now that we cannot regard this planet being fenced in and secure, abiding place for men. For man. He never can never appreciate the unforeseen
you never appreciate that unforeseen good or evil that it may come upon us suddenly as space. It may be that the later larger designs of the universe, this invasion from Mars is not without its ultimate benefit for men. It has robbed us of the serene confidence of the future. It is the most fruitful source of decadence against us to human science. It is brought on enormous. It has done much to com- promote the concept the common will of mankind. It may be that across the immensity of space, the Martians have watched the fate, their pioneers are theirs, and learned their lesson, that on the planet Venus, they have found a secure settlement. But in that as may be, be, that it may, for many years yet, there will certainly be no relaxation, eager scrutiny in the Martian disk. Their fairy darts to the sky, shooting stars will bring with them a fall, they fell on an unavoidable reparation to all sons of man. Broadening of man's views as a result it can scarcely be, scarcely be exaggerated. For the sinner fell as a general persuasion that through all the deep space no life existed beyond the pretty, sur- pretty surface of a mini- miniature aspire. But now we see further. If the Martian could reach Venus, there's no reason to suppose that their thing is possible for men. Their slow calling the sun makes this earth unhabitable. At least, at last, it must do. It may be that the thread of life begun here will have streamed out and caught our sister planet with its toll wheels. Dim and wonderful is that vision I have conjured up in my mind of life spreading wholly, slowly for this little seedbed the solar system throughout the inanimate vastness so sub so real side real space that is in a remote dream it may be on the other hand the destruction of martians is only a repet- reprieve to them and not to us perhaps there's a future is a future of deigned most of the stress and danger of time left by binding sense of doubt and insecurity of my mind Sit in my study, writing by lamplight, sunny sea again, healing valley below, set with rivering flames, to the house behind, and about me, empty and desolate. Go out into the Benfleet Road, vehicles pass me, a butcher boy in a cart, cab for visitors, school workmen a bicycle, children going to school, and suddenly they came vague, come vague, unreal, and hurry again. The Ayatollahman, Ayatollahman, with a hot, brooding silence. Or at night, I see the black powder darkening the silent streets. Contorted bodies shrouded in that layer. They rise upon me, tattered and dog bitten. They gather and grow fiercer, paler, uglier, uglier, more distortions of humanity. Alas, they wake, cold and wretched, in the darkness of the night. I go to London, see the busy monks in Fleet Street and Strand. It comes across my mind they are but the ghosts of the past, haunting the streets I have seen silent and wretched, going to and fro phantasiums of a dead city, mocking life in a galvanized body. As strange too is it is to stand on Primrose Row Hill, and as I did by the day before writing this last chapter, to see the great province of the houses, dim and blue for the haze of smoke, this vanishing at last in the vague lower sky to see the people walking to and fro among the flower beds to the, the hill, see the sightseers about the Martian machine as signs is still to hear the tumult playing children and recall the time I saw it all bright and clear cut, hard and silent upon the dawn of the great out of the last great day. Dreams of all is to hold my wife's hand again, to think I have counted her and that she can be among the dead. End of the Wall of the Wales, written, read by Mark Anthony Rains.